as I already kind of pointed out, we're starting a new series. Um, I know I'm going to preach at least two parts of this and then maybe rotate some different uh, uh, people to preach <clears throat> sort of in the same series. This topic is boundaries, okay? And I, I, you know, I think there's been books called Boundaries. I've heard of other people preaching uh, series, sermons uh, on the idea of boundaries. Uh, you know, and I'm not trying to jump on any fad or anything like that. But the idea is, and that's kind of something I've actually been wanting to preach on for quite a while in, a, in some series, is the, the fact is we need in our life boundaries. Boundaries are essential, right? Whether it's raising kids, kids need boundaries, right? Whether it's uh, trying to get discipline in our own life so we won't walk in the flesh or whatever, we need boundaries. And so there, this idea comes up a lot, but the thing is in our society, the society in which we live, boundaries are not something that people want. You know, they don't want any boundaries. They don't want any rules. You know, there's a couple uh, sayings out there like rules are made to be broken. You ever heard that? And I remember even as a little kid thinking, well, really rules are meant to be followed. <laughs> but you know, the, the, if you think about it, but the, but the idea is a mentality that, hey, they put the rules there. We want to see how close we can you know get to breaking those rules or even break them or whatever push the envelope as far as we can uh, the other idea is think outside the box yeah this is a common one as a creative person right an artist and I like to create and everything I remember particularly in my teen years uh, just kind of like trying my best to think outside the box so to speak and there in this idea of hey I'm a creative person well what do you mean by creative well I like to think outside the box and the reality is most artists that are good artists they're not really thinking outside the box they're following a set of rules they're fi following a set of uh, uh, you know skill strategies of, of ways to go about doing things and if anyone thinks that they're thinking outside the box and they're coming up with some new form of art, it looks like contemporary art. <laughs> Have you ever seen contemporary art? Like they will sit there and, and, and look at that and try to figure out the deep meaning and pay thousands and thousands of dollars for it. Now, look, there are some, there's some contemporary art that I actually like, but the reality is, you know, if somebody just kind of it's up paint on a, a canvas or something like that and says, hey, I'm thinking outside the box, right? I don't want to do the traditional art. I just want my own like contemporary, just like expressing myself and whatever. Look, if you're honest, most of the time it just looks like garbage, <laughs> okay? You can try to be, you know, sophisticated and try to make it mean something else, but most of the guys looking at that stuff are drunk anyway. <laughs> Okay, I've been to art galleries. I know that's how it works. Get them drunk, tell them this is thousands of dollars. They want to show everybody how much money they have, and so they'll buy it, and, and, and it'll just sit in their, uh, their basement or something like that. All right, but there's this mentality in our society that says, hey, we just always got to think of a different angle. We got to do it differently. Now, look, to some degree, I understand people who have got the basics down uh, of a particular subject, you know, they, they understand how to do that. Maybe they want to take a different approach. I understand how that works. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my parents would buy me these like uh, uh, coloring books from like the dollar store or whatever. You get these really cheap coloring books with these pictures in it. And what I would do is I'd take a, an ink pen and I would add to that and make my own like shapes and backgrounds and all that and color that. Well, I'm, in my mind, I'm like, I'm thinking outside the box, right? And there's a, there's a normal mentality that thinks like, hey, if you just submit and you just follow the rules or whatever, then you're actually, you know, you're actually not doing it right. You're supposed to be breaking rules. You're supposed to be pushing uh, the boundaries. Why? Because this is human nature for us to think this way. <clears throat> so the basic idea of what this series is about, what this, the, the concept of boundaries is the, simply this, that boundaries are essential. All throughout the Bible, I think there's a lot of areas we can look at that and lots of different applications we can take. But what I want to show in this message tonight is simply this, that before the fall of man, I mean, that was a boundary right there, wasn't it? All the, tre all the trees of the garden you can freely eat except one tree. That's a, that's a commandment. That's a restriction or a boundary. All right. But even before the fall of man, even before that commandment, in the very first chapter, we find at least four boundaries that God gave us, okay? So the title of this message would be, God created the world with boundaries. 
Number one, real quickly, look at verse one. God gave us this boundary of time. All right, he created time. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, I remember one time this guy, creation, a creationist, I guess, I don't even remember what his name was, who, who, who said it, but uh, some guy said, in the very first verse of the, I mean, the very first chapter of the Bible, the first verse of that chapter, God spells out everything in creation that was that that exists. In other words, if someone's looking at science trying to figure out the ingredients of the world, how everything came about or whatever, they've come to the conclusion with the, the smartest minds being collected together, trying to figure out everything that exists in this world. And I'm sure they've added some things that aren't on this list, but I'm just saying for the most part, they broke it down to its simplest components. And they said, here are the elements that exist in this world. There are, there's time, right? And then there's force. Some people would say energy. Uh, I'm not super scientific, so I don't know, uh, you know, if, if you, if you got an argument on this, that's not important. The time <laughs> force, matter uh, uh space and matter okay so sure enough in the beginning that's time right god created there's some kind of action happening some energy some some force that exists that's creating some in the beginning god created or you got you got uh uh time you got uh energy or force the heavens and the earth okay so heavens you got space and the earth you've got everything that exists on this earth uh, that has to do with matter. So all those things that have to exist. So you talk to somebody about, uh, can something come from nothing? Absolutely not. So where did it all come from? Well, these things had to exist. They're going to take you to these things. And sure enough, first book, first verse of the Bible, God says, all these things exist. He put them into existence. So what was, what was anything like? What was God like? What was heaven like? Whatever before the beginning when God created all this, I have no idea, right? This is beyond my mind to even think about time not existing, all right? I know that God exists past, present, and future. I can kind of understand that. I mean, not, I mean, not really understand it, but I can kind of grasp that principle, but I don't understand. I don't understand how, how things can exist outside of time. Uh, so uh, God made time. And there's nothing we can do to stop time. Don't you wish you don't you wish you could? All right. One exception in the Bible, that's Joshua 10, where Joshua prays that the sun stands still and, and time freezes there for a period of time. But uh, uh, but actually we cannot uh, we cannot change 24 hours a day. That's all we got. All right. Now um, in that is the element, the, the, the fact that we have to sleep. Now, I don't know, uh, I can't really make an argument exactly for what happened after God, when God created uh, the first man, first woman, but we know that uh, Adam went into a deep sleep whenever Eve was, was taken from his ribs. So, so the sleep existed. It seems to be a concept God put into man. And what am I saying by that? Well, you only have so many hours in the day, and also you need sleep. All right. And so, uh, you know, naturally man tries to push that envelope and says, well, you know what? I don't need sleep. I think I can come up with another way. Look, if you don't get sleep, you might be able to get by for a little while, but if you don't get sleep, what's going to happen? You're not going to be productive. You're not going to be able to function. Your body's going to start shutting down. You're going to get sick. Uh, and so look, whether you like it or not, you got so many hours in a day, you're going to have to get sleep. I was just talking to brother, uh, Austin about how, uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I started watching some engineers, which is really funny because I'm not really an engineer type of a guy. Okay. But I started watching these guys and I'm just, just amazed by like, uh, uh, the things that they can create and just the mathematics and everything that goes into it just blows my mind, but it's neat to watch, uh, these guys do that. And, and, and twice this last week, I watched somebody uh, make something and they had to stay up all night to do it because there's so much troubleshooting and they got deadlines and they want to get it done. And so they stay up, uh, you know, really late and about like four o'clock in the morning, they're just like not able to function. And so finally they're like, you know what, I'm just going to go and get some sleep. And then they come back the next day and they find all these mistakes that they made the night before because they tried to push it and stay awake and make their, make their mind uh, go. Now look, sometimes, look at Proverbs chapter 6. 
sometimes you are going to have to make the most out of 24 hours and you're going to have to stay awake. I understand that. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if thou be sure, uh, surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thy eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So there's this idea like, you know, you, there, you're you involved in this debt or you're involved in something that, has, you know, that you've got it, gotten into and there's a way to get yourself out of that. Give diligence until that's done. We don't want to be like the, the lazy man, the slum, slumbering man who you know doesn't pay attention to those kinds of things. There's a time where he says, hey, I'm just going to keep on working. I'm going to keep on putting effort into it until this thing's done. Uh, I know I personally, I guess I'm sure none of you guys would ever imagine this, but I have a tendency to put some things <laughs> off until the last minute. And it seems like that, that last time that I have, maybe in school, some of you guys can relate to this. You have a project that's due and you wait it to the last minute. But that time that goes into that last uh, a few days or maybe even few hours of putting into that, man, they're super productive, aren't they? Because <laughs> you're just forcing yourself to get things done. But sometimes you have got to just keep pushing, keep pushing because you got a deadline. But at the end of the day, you have got to get rest. Okay, so naturally what happens, people say, well, you know what, I don't need sleep. And I joke like that sometimes, and I'm like, you know what, I'll sleep in heaven, right, or, or something like that. I don't need rest. I can just keep on going. And some people, uh, you know, have said that about me because they'll know, like, I'll get up super early because I'll have certain things to do or I'll stay up super late or whatever. But look, my body knows as much, how much it can handle. And there's some days I might have a day where I worked like 24 hours or whatever, just kept working, working, working. Well, guess what? Next day, maybe day and a half, I'm not doing a whole lot <laughs> because my body has got to recuperate or I fall asleep or whatever. But some people think they can just cheat nature and say like, I'm just going to fill myself up with caffeine and just keep on drinking caffeine, sugar, whatever it takes. I'm going to just keep on uh, uh, going or, or take these substances or something like that. Look, it's all in the end going to hurt you. <laughs> it's all going to, uh, you're going to get to this point where your body's not functioning because God made your body only be able to handle so much. And sometimes we need rest, okay? But God made time. We can't cheat time. It's a boundary that he put upon us that we, we wish sometimes that we could. We come up with technology and time savers and ways to, to, to make more time. Uh, but it, it, obviously, we, we, I don't know about you, but have you noticed that technology, uh, it seems, to, I mean, obviously you can get a lot done in a smaller amount of time with technology. For instance, you know, think about, I think about this a lot when I'm watching my wife and my daughter cook. And I'm thinking like, man, they spent so many hours putting into this meal, making this meal. And I'm thinking, what did they do back in the pioneer days <laughs> or back in the, the Bible days where they didn't have the technology uh, that we have now? And I'm thinking it was like a whole day project. The, the night before, they're already preparing stuff for like the next meals for the next day or whatever. It's just this, this, this long uh, process. But if you ever notice, it seems like modern technology hasn't really given us any more like time. <laughs> We're still bound by time. We still, you're always running late. Always, you know, you can never get ahead. All right. And so we're bound by that. God gave us this uh, as a boundary. Uh, this, I know this doesn't, there's so many places we're going to go in this series, Lord willing, on the topic of boundaries. This might seem a little strange to start here, but, but I just found it so interesting. In the very first book of the Bible, we see God created the world with boundaries. And one thing that he created was time. Okay. Secondly, he created, as you read through that chapter, you notice that he created uh, kinds of plants and animals, right? Kinds of plants and animals. I'm not going to spend a whole lot on this topic because it's so obvious, I think, to us. And we believe the Bible. We, we deny uh, evolution. But there's a lot of people uh, out there that teach that, you know, the, we have just evolved and, and one... Uh, 
uh, kind of, of creature turned into another creature over millions, millions of years of evolution, all that kind of stuff. And there's people that are trying to so hard to prove that. And they're messing around with like cloning uh, different creatures and stuff. Now, now, I really think if they could clone uh, a dinosaur, I, I, it'd be pretty cool to see a dinosaur, okay? But, <laughs> but other than that, man, all this messing around with clones, I saw just recently an article, uh, I didn't read the whole thing, but I saw where they have successfully cloned animals that were extinct. Now, how do they do that? Well, it always comes down to they didn't really clone it, but they took like some of the DNA from a, a dead animal that was frozen or something like that. And then they injected it into a living animal. So they produced some kind of half breed or something like, I don't know what they all did. Uh, it doesn't really uh, matter in the long run, but they're tampering with that. So look, the world wants to tamper with cloning and, and crossbreeding. Uh, I'm all right to some extent with farm, you know, uh, people, uh, ranchers and, and, and all they, they have, successfully crossbred some some creatures <laughs> you know what is it uh let, let, let me they've, they've done uh zebras and donkeys right what's that called a zonkey it is uh, they've they've crossed tigers and lions what's it called tie on or a liger right what would you call a human uh uh crossbred with a chimpanzee a human z or a <laughs> or a, ch <laughs> a, a, a chimpa sapien or something. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, okay? When they're cloning and or, or messing with uh, breeding animals, okay, and you can go from, you know, these two animals, hey, look, we successfully created this other uh, species of animal or whatever, which it use, which is which is 100% of the time like sterile and can't produce uh, anything else beyond that. But you know what the thing is? These two things had a, 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 had a relationship that was super close. And that's why they were able to even do that. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. So different types of dogs. Yeah, they can, they can crossbreed those. And so you can get a wolf, you know, maybe it would crossbreed with some other type of a dog and they would, and it would make a, a certain type of a dog. That's why we have all these different types of dogs, Chihuahua to a Great Dane. Hey, they weren't all on the ark. Okay. You, everybody understands that, don't they? <laughs> all right. These are different things that over time they've been able to crossbreed and they've been, but they're all dogs, right? Uh, they did the same thing with uh, all types of different animals, horses and, and donkeys, and they've created all these different, you know, things to uh, be able to help. A lot, most of the animals we have today, uh, you know, whether it's food that we eat or, or cattle that we use have been tampered with in one way or another. Okay. Most of the fruits and vegetables that we eat today have been tampered with uh, in one way or another. Uh, not long ago, I was talking to some guys in here about corn, you know, and corn in the Bible really throws people off. And I myself I get confused sometimes and think about corn like we think of corn. But actually, when it's talking about corn in the Bible, it's talking about, the, the, it's talking about wheat, all right? The corn of the, of the wheat. And uh, uh, anyway, that's a whole, a whole other subject. But most of the stuff that we see today, yes, it's been tampered with. But it doesn't prove evolution because from the very beginning, the first chapter of the Bible, God said he's going to create this kind of animal and it's going to bring forth fruit after its kind. This kind of plant is going to bring forth fruit after its kind. Well, what's a kind? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, but you know how we've created, uh, you know, what is it? Kingdom, uh, phylum, species, you know, and, and, and we got this whole list of terms. Well, this is, that doesn't matter. Okay. The Bible trumps all that anyway. First book of the Bible, first chapter we see this idea that God made kinds of plants and kinds of animals. So what does the world try to do? Hey, we got to, we got to mess with that. All right. We've got to figure out how to, uh, you know, how to create a different kind from this kind or something like that, but it's not going to work because God made ki different kinds. The third thing we see, uh, this is a topic I've preached on several times. God made male and female. Male and female. Now, somebody's going to try to throw some kind of, uh, you know, oh, yeah, well, what about a worm? What about this, uh, this kind of creature in, in, in nature? Well, God made exceptions, okay? He made some interesting creatures out there. There's no doubt about that. But when it comes to 
humans and it comes to most animal life, you see there's a male and there's a female. That's how it worked. That's the way he designed it. He, he gave us a certain boundary in that way. So naturally, though, what do people want to do? We're, in our human nature, we want to break boundaries. And so all of a sudden, all the girls want to be tomboys, little bitty girls, right? Just thinking, well, I want to be like the boys. I want to uh, climb the trees. Nothing wrong with girls climbing trees. But I don't want to do this. I want to do that. And as they grow up with this like proud, like, hey, I was a tomboy, right? Well, okay, you might have done some things that, you, you, you know, seem to kind of push the boundaries of what most girls do or something like that. But look, you have to stay within those boundaries and, try, and seeking to go beyond those boundaries isn't going to work. Our society today, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you guys, I'm sure, but our society today is, is like just totally insane yep. when it comes to gender or sexuality, you know, Male versus female, just just as does uh, like they try to pretend like it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's like the most scientific thing. I mean, it exists. So we got this crazy idea of sports, these co-ed sports, where they're thinking that you know, girls, guys, hey, we can't we can't judge. They can you know compete in sports. Uh, God made boundaries. He made. Uh, you know, men a certain way and he made women a certain way. And look, there's a lot of variance. There's a lot of uh, 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 different, you know, uh, features w built within our DNA that would allow us to, to you know, to, there to be a lot of variances. Go back to that poodle versus a Great Dane. That's a, there's a lot of variances, right? Look at the size and shapes of, of humans and the colors of human. You know, that all came from Adam and Eve. Red, yellow, black, white, you know, the little variance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, some, some women are bigger and then there's some men that are scrawny. You know, you're looking at it, you're thinking, hey, that woman could beat up that man. But for the most part, God made this as a boundary. You're male, you're female. First chapter of the Bible. <clears throat> and so... Uh, you know, our society tries to break to break that and to confuse gender and all that kind of stuff, but we need to stay inside the line. In fact, I would say Christians now more than ever, just looking around what's going on, this push. I heard today they were supposed to take like the first vote for the, uh, gen, no, what's it called? A equality, uh, equality Act or something like that. And the representatives are supposed to vote on, uh, on this and then it's going to go receive another vote. I don't know how, how that works, but you say, what's the Equality Act? Man, uh, the current administration is just trying to throw everything just at once. Every administration does that. Trump, when he got in, did the same thing. Hey, let's hurry up and undo everything that the, that the last administration did. Every, but they're doing it in such weird, sneaky ways, like passing this, uh, you know, COVID, you know, our whole world is struggling so bad with COVID. We've got to, we've got to pass these, these relief bills, right? Give some people some relief. And everybody's like, oh, I can't wait for the next stimulus check. And we don't even realize that in that stimulus package, they hid some weird things that have nothing to do with stimulus and trying to help our, our economy. But let's, let's throw uh, 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 these, these weird, really weird things in there, like, uh, things that historically Democrats have been saying that they're going to do, raising minimum wage and all that stuff. But anyway, so they're pushing all these really strange things. Well, one of the things they're trying to do is get to where, uh, and they're getting really close, I think, with the uh, Obama administration, uh, which is just, this is just Obama administration part two, really. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they're trying to go back. And one of the things they're trying to do is get to where a church cannot refuse like homosexuals or something like that can't refuse anybody. We have to allow them it's like equal rights. And, and it's kind of like back to the whole bacon and cake thing. If you remember that whole ordeal and, and, and they're trying really hard to make churches like where, where we don't have a say over that. And that's, I mean, that's not really, that's not going to happen. I mean, what are they, well, we got to take away your tax status. I don't care. Take away my tax status, right? Uh, where God's going to be, you know, the supreme, you know, God, I must obey God rather than man. Uh, but it's really, really strange what's going on in our society and the things they're trying to push and the things that they're trying to uh, claim exist that don't exist. And now more than ever as Christians, what we need to do is we need to say, you know what? I'm going to stay in the lines. 
I'm going to, I'm not going to try to go outside the box and try to stretch. I'm going to stay inside the lines. And I don't mean the lines that the world is, is putting out there. I'm talking about the lines of what the Bible says. Okay. And so we need to now more than ever make some, even some sacrifices. You know, it's not easy. <clears throat> It's not easy for a, a women these days, not as easy as it once was, to make sure they've got modest skirts that fit right and they look feminine and all that for guys to find even a pair of jeans that don't look like women's jeans or, or something like that. And it's getting harder and harder, so it involves a little bit of sacrifice. But let me tell you something about sacrifice. Look at 2 Samuel 24. Second Samuel 24. Before I read that one, let me read to you First Samuel, First uh, Samuel 15, where Samuel is. Uh, no, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. First Samuel. Samuel is talking to uh, uh, to Saul, and Saul. You remember the story? He was supposed to destroy all the Amalekites, but. Uh, but but he didn't, and he says, hey, well, I kept these sheep so that I can sacrifice them, right? And so here's what he says, famous words. He says, and, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. The idea is the whole point of making these sacrifices is because you're obeying God. And so, you know, you, you're, you're wanting to do this. You, you can't say... Uh, like the, the illustration I use a lot is this lady that I knew who got tattoos. And I was trying to explain how what I believe the Bible says about tattoos and, and all this kind of stuff. And she's like, well, you don't understand. All the tattoos I have, have uh, indicate special times in my life where I had a spiritual uh, growth or something with the Lord. And I remember thinking about this verse and saying, well, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Like, I'm going to sacrifice my body and get a tattoo for the Lord. Well, he never wanted you to do that to begin with. <laughs> and so it doesn't really make sense that you would do, say, well, I'm doing it for the Lord. Look, the Lord wants you to obey. And so you say, well, it's a, it's a sacrifice for me. You don't understand. Like uh, I, I've heard a lot of women say, well, look, we can't do those certain activities if we're dressed that way. Well, maybe you don't do the activities, you know, or maybe you have to do an extra step. I've seen people, uh, you know, have to be a little bit creative when it comes to the material that they use or how they sew uh, skirts or something like that. They're sacrifices, right? But look, anything we're going to do for the Lord should require a little bit of a sacrifice, don't you think? Look at 2 Samuel 24, verse 24. <clears throat> I like what David says here. He says, Let's see here. And the king said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer a burnt offering unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. They were just going to give it to him. Say, so here, just take them, just take them. He's like, well, that wouldn't make sense. I want to I want to give something to the Lord that caused a sacrifice, okay? So all these trends today that are like, hey, you know, it's trendy to, to break the rules. It's trendy to, like, you know, push the boundaries and, and all that kind of stuff. Look, don't follow the trends. <laughs> Stay in the lines. Obey, obey God. It's rather to, uh, better to obey than to sacrifice, and, and, and obeying nowadays sometimes takes a sacrifice is what my point there. Okay. So God made time. God made kinds of plants and animals. These are all boundaries that he gave us. God made male and female. And then fourth of all, God made a chain of command, a chain of command. And this isn't something that's popular either. Man is supposed to have dominion over all the animals, right? Man is supposed to look, we've got animals. We can eat animals. We can train animals. We can get them to do our work. We can do all these kinds of things. And so what does our world do? Tries to push the, 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 the boundaries of the chain of command. And hey, animals ha should have rights too. And so guy, <laughs> you know, uh, if, you, if you're operating a, a, a dairy farm, Okay, look, I, I take my son to the to his work where he works on a dairy farm, and there's like these signs everywhere that are put up there like, hey, we make sure that we treat our animals humanely and all that. Why? Because people like PETA and all that come in there and they say, hey, you got these animals too close to each other. You didn't give enough space. You got all the, and they put all these like, there's all these groups out there just trying 
you know, animal rights and, 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 you know, in some cases people are getting so attached to their animals that almost putting like more value on their animals than people. Hey, we've had some good conversations about that. Uh, people that we know that do that, but God said, look, these are, you know, you're supposed to have dominion over them. You're supposed to rule over them. You're supposed to use them for, for your own purposes. Now, it would be a, if, if it's a waste, if you're wasting animals or you're like, you know, harming other people's animals or, or there's, there's all kinds of ways where we could say, hey, people are doing this wrong, okay, in the way that we treat animals. But look, if somebody, uh, you know, goes out and, and shoots, a, shoots a dog because it's eating their trash or something like that, they haven't committed a sin, <laughs> Okay, if they uh, uh, and so anyway, animals uh, are there; they're 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 to be uh, ruled over. But not only that, in the very first chapter of the Bible, we see a chain of command where God made Adam. Now, in chat, we don't see it until chapter two because chapter one just says He made them male and female, created He them. But when you get to chapter two, we see that God is going to tell Adam, uh, you know, hey, it's not good for him to be alone, and He's going to make a wife to be a help that's meet for him and to be able to help him and all that kind of stuff. And so God makes that in other places in the Bible, it says, Hey, it was the man that was made first. Right. And then, uh, and there's this idea, like you say, well, that's just not fair. That's the chain of command. That's the boundary that God gave us. And every time people try to break God's boundaries, it's not what's best for them. Okay, and so uh, this is a situation that we see in our society today. Uh, very unpopular to talk about boundaries and talk about uh, chain of command. Hey, we all want to be equal. We don't want to have to uh, have any kind of uh, anyone authority over us. Look, there's always going to be somebody who's smarter than you, somebody who's stronger than you, richer than you. Uh, you know, there always there's always going to be somebody who rules over you. That's just the way it is. And you can throw out this, oh no, this beautiful world where we're going to create this utopia of socialism and, and communism and all that stuff. Look, it's not going to work. God gave boundaries and he made sure that everybody has those who rule over them. And if you try to break that boundary, you're in for a big surprise because somebody's going to rule over you whether you, whether you like it or not. Uh, but there's a, there are chains of command. Look at uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is, not, uh, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And so uh, that's where we see the uh, creation of the woman. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Likewise, your husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. <gasps> what do you mean weaker? <laughs> There's a chain of command. There's one that's stronger than the others as being heirs together and of the grace, uh, uh, grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. And uh, look at uh, Titus, if you would. Titus chapter 2. Verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient unto their husbands, that the word of God may be blasphemed. You say, well, that is just ridiculous. I don't like that boundary that God gave us. I think women should be able to rule over men if they want to, and they should be able to do that. And I just recently read an article that said that the Southern Baptists, uh, you know, somebody had claimed that the Southern Baptists did not allow uh, women pastors. And so somebody did a search, and they started looking up all these different churches. And maybe it depends on how you define pastor. Maybe they... Maybe there's no Southern Baptist churches where, I don't even think that's true. I think there are, are uh, what do they call it? Like a lot of contemporary churches have lots of multiple pastors, but they have like a lead pastor. Right? I'm, I'm pretty sure even Southern Baptists, I think they even have some lead, 
some ladies who are lead pastors. But uh, but look, so they had this big list and you can go to each of these websites and you can go on there and then there's like, uh, you know, ladies who are over, they're like the, the music pastor or the children's pastor or the, uh, you know, evangelism uh, pastor or something like that. And they've given uh, the women all these, these charges. And we've probably all been to churches like that. You know, you get in there and you're like, this church, it might have a man who's the lead pastor, but this is a woman-run church, right? Uh, not this church. I'm saying we've all been to churches. <laughs> we've all been to churches where, uh, where that is the case. Okay, the Bible teaches us otherwise. Okay, and 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 it doesn't matter how hard you try to buck that and how hard you try to break the the, the command. This is the way uh, that God made it. This is the boundary that He gave us. So we're not less. You're not less of a human because you choose to stay within your boundaries, okay? I don't know if you remember when I was talking about the attire of a pastor and I was just talking about people who are in roles of leadership and they've done all these studies, you know, and the majority of the guys who, uh, who are high up and they're very influential and all that respected and successful and they started looking at the trends and a lot of them, you know, wore suit and tie and they dressed up and they looked, you know, they dressed their best, dressed for success and all that kind of stuff. And then I said, well, there are some exceptions. There are some people that tried to break the rule and they decided, Hey, I'm not going to dress like, like, like that. I'm going to, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be different. And if you look at churches, a lot of uh, contemporary type churches, the pastors did that and they said, you know what, I'm going to start dressing this way. I'm going to start wearing the shorts and the Hawaiian shirt and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to start like, you know, wearing the skinny jeans and the, uh, you know, all these kinds of things because I want to be different. And, there, and, and in our society today, that works because people say, yeah, he's a rebel. Yeah, he's somebody I don't want to follow. He's a no, no, no. You're not less of a human being because you decide I want to stay within the boundaries. And I want to keep the rules and I want to do, you know, God made those for a reason. It's right to try to stay within, to the best of our ability, stay within the boundaries that God gave us. It's right and it's pleasing to God to say, hey, if God made these boundaries, I want to do the best I can and to be pleasing to him and to submit to the boundaries that he gave. Okay, and the I just wanted to show in this sermon as an introduction to this idea of boundaries that even before the fall of man, you know, even before he announced the, the tree in the garden and gave any command of any sort, whatever, God just created the laws of nature and, and, and the physiological uh, uh, rules and laws that exist. He created boundaries. I just thought of four of them, probably a lot more that we can think of. Uh, but these are boundaries that he gave us. There's nothing you can do about it. There's rules, there's laws, there's boundaries. And the fact is we need them. We need them. They're essential. Let's pray. Father, I uh, pray that you'll help us to understand the boundaries you've set out in your word. This is just an uh, introduction, of course, but we realize that you made us to have boundaries and you gave us uh, uh, the ability to, uh, to try to have freedom and push boundaries as much as we can. But I pray that as Christians, uh, those who choose to follow you, that you'll help us to, to learn to love the boundaries and to love the uh, uh the, the, your law, to love your law, love your commands, uh, love the, the, the boundaries you've given us to follow. And I pray that you'll help us uh, to get better at that and to not have the rebellious heart and attitude that wants to uh, constantly break rules and laws and, and all that. Lord, help us have wisdom and know uh, what you would expect of us and, and why you've put in certain laws uh, that you've given us. Lord, and so I pray that you bless this series as we go on and uh, maybe as some of the other guys uh, preach on this subject, I pray, Lord, that you'll bless it and you'll help us grow a little closer to you and walk in your word. In Jesus name I pray.